So the title of my presentation is The Role of Kundalini in Evolution. And next slide, please. In the description of the uh, presentation, I asked the question, uh, why is it throughout all of human history, or recorded history, uh, we've been plagued by wars, revolutions, uh, and most lately terrorism? And this is even more relevant in the, uh, the modern age because now we have uh, technological advancements, which, uh, you know, we have weapons of mass destruction that can kill people by the millions of tens of millions. And also, we also have the prospect of unstable leadership. So I would uh, like to present the idea that the answer to this question is Kundalini Shakti. Now, what does Kundalini Shakti have to do with evolution specifically? Um, Gopi Krishna in, entitled one of his presentations many years ago, Kundalini, the guardian of human evolution. And next slide, please, Mike. I would like to talk first of all about evolution uh, a little bit. Uh, evolution is probably one of the most disputed topics in all of science. But one thing that is generally agreed upon, although maybe not by the creationists, is that from the beginning of life, billions of years ago, uh, life forms have tended to progress in general, and I repeat, in general, from lower order complexity to higher order complexity. So in the last so many millions of years, we have had the, uh, since the dinosaurs, we have had the uh, mammals have evolved, then the higher order primates, and finally uh, mankind with uh, our powerful intellect. And this intellect has given us the ability to transform the planet. So what would the next step in evolution logically be? Well, if the intellect is a new faculty of mind that has come into existence uh, over the basic animal consciousness, then we would expect another faculty of mind beyond the intellect to be the next thing to evolve. Next slide, please. Um, enlightenment is this new faculty of perception that is evolving in the race. This is the proposition I'm, I'm putting forward. And that the enlightened uh, sages and seers, the founders of the great face of mankind, were actually forerunners of the race to come. So what exactly is enlightenment? Well, in a general sense, enlightenment is the ability to perceive layers or levels of creation beyond the physical. Next slide. So more specifically, we might say that enlightenment is the ability to directly perceive consciousness as the primary reality. Now, this is a reversal of the way that the intellect perceives. The intellect perceives uh, the primary reality first. The physical universe is, is the primary reality. Next slide, please. Now, science views consciousness in a very different way. As far as science is concerned, consciousness is simply a consequence of electrochemical activity in the neurons of the brain. No more, no less. When we die, it's extinguished. And science does not believe that consciousness can have, can have any independent existence outside of living organisms. However, one of the uh, most successful branches of science, uh, quantum theory, uh, has a very different attitude towards consciousness. And in quantum theory, uh, one of the basic tenets is is that subatomic particles, which makes up the phenomenal universe, do not actually exist until they are observed. Until then, they are simply waves of potential or probability. It is the very act of being observed which gives them form and substance. So how can it possibly be that the very thing, consciousness, which gives reality form and substance, could at the same time be a simple byproduct of that physical reality? Uh, there's a huge contradiction here. Next slide, please. Now, if we look at our, if we compare our individual consciousness to the physical creation, we see that our, our awareness is kind of like a, a small bubble in and around our heads. And when we look out at the, the physical creation, we see a, something that is so unimaginably vast that it dwarfs our individual consciousness, our individual self, into complete and utter insignificance. But in the enlightened state, this position is reversed. And we realize, this is why the term realization comes from, we realize that that spark of consciousness within us is actually of the same essence as the universal consciousness, but is finite rather than being infinite. Next slide, please. And 
our individual consciousness is, if we compare the, the universal consciousness to an ocean, our individual consciousness is kind of like a drop in that ocean of the same essence, but just a drop. And as Gopi Krishna has described in his autobiography, he said, in this state, the phenomenal universe is reduced to being like a thin layer of foam on the surface of this, this, uh, this vast ocean of consciousness. So next slide, please. So I'd like to talk for a little bit about the what I call the Kundalini mechanism, how Kundalini actually works. Next slide, please. Now, as far as science is concerned, Kundalini is it just doesn't fit. The idea of Kundalini is inconsistent with the paradigm of reality that science currently holds. And this is primarily because science does not recognize the independent existence of consciousness. Next slide, please. But uh, many of the spiritual traditions, or all of them pretty well, and specifically the Indian spiritual tradition, which goes back uh, at least 5,000 years of continuous study of mind and consciousness, very quickly came to the realization that consciousness is the primary reality. And in the Upanishads, which were the early ones, which were written from, say, 800 BCE to the start of the Common Era, they gave a name to this ultimate reality, and they called it Brahman. Next slide, please. Now, Brahman is very difficult for us to conceive because it really has no physical attributes. It has no size, shape, color, texture, form. Uh, it is beyond time and space. So really, uh, at this current stage of our evolution, we have almost no hope of even remotely uh, conceiving it. But in order to make it more understandable, the ancient sages, uh, realizing that our minds work in, in dualistic terms, you know, we think, you know, up, down, backwards and forwards, good and evil, light and dark, hot and cold, active and passive. Our minds are comfortable in thinking in dualistic terms. So the ancient sages said that we might want to try to understand this reality uh, as having two different aspects to it. Uh, we could consider these as being the static and dynamic aspects of consciousness or of, of reality, as uh, Arthur Avalon has, uh, has put it in, in his book, The Serpent Power. The static aspect is an omniscient, infinite consciousness. Again, beyond time and space, unmoving, unchanging. And they represented this aspect of reality with the male deity Shiva. The dynamic aspect of creation is an infinite, omnipotent, creative power, active in time and space and changing. And they personify this aspect with the female deity Shakti. So what I'd like to do now uh, is talk about uh, how the different Indian philosophical systems uh, interpreted this, because from the time of the Upanishads onwards, all of the different philosophical systems in India tried to explain this dichotomy in, in the best way they could, how something could be infinite and finite, uh, static and dynamic uh, at the same time. And some of these systems of explanation are very involved and complex. So, for instance, the tantric system, according to Arthur Avalon, has 36 different levels of evolution from the spark of the infinite con or the spark of the individual consciousness in us to physical matter. And uh, they evolve one from the other. Now, this is a little bit involved. And so what I've done in the last several years is to come up with my own scheme of expressing this. And I, I call these the aspects of Shakti. Now, I'm going to skim over these very, very superficially in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. For those of you who are interested in exploring this in more detail, uh, you can go to the uh, icrcanada.org website. And in the research section, uh, the second last category, I believe it's called uh, Kundalini and the Evolutionary Process. Uh, there are two articles there, one called The New Paradigm and the other called Prana and Kundalini aspects of Shakti. And I go over this whole thing in much more detail. So next slide. So the first aspect to come into operation that must come into operation is Maya Shakti. And the way Arthur Avalon explains it, he said that Shakti takes a spark of this infinite consciousness and it contracts it to a point, which in Sanskrit is called Bindu. And this is our individual consciousness. And then it veils it from itself so that it does not realize that it is infinite. Uh, next slide. The next aspect of Shakti is Prakriti Shakti. Now, Prakriti is a term from one of the six major philosophical systems of India. And it refers to the Samkhya system. And it refers to uh, Prakriti as 
the phenomenal universe, kind of similar to the, the term Shakti I used earlier. And in this aspect of Shakti, uh, first we have, starting from this, this, this point of consciousness, we have first, we have three levels of mind evolve, and then the various senses, and then finally uh, the physical world, the phenomenal universe, the physical matter. And this is kind of like a, a projector in a way. And I know every, every one of us, uh, I would say, has probably had the experience of uh, being in a movie theater and being becoming so engrossed in what was being projected on the screen of the theater that uh, we became oblivious to what was going on around us. And I know personally, when I sat and watched that first Jurassic Park movie and that T-Rex was chasing after the Jeep with Jeff Goldblum in it, I was oblivious <laughs> to everything. So this is the, the second aspect, is Prakriti Shakti. The third aspect of Shakti is Prana Shakti. Now here, Prana is somewhat of a confusing term because it is used in two very different and distinct ways. Most of us are used to thinking of Prana Shakti as what we might call the life energy in us. Uh, the Chinese chi and, uh, you know, the bioenergy or uh, orgone energy of Wilhelm Reich. Uh, it is something we can perceive with our minds. We can, to some degree, direct it and move it with our minds. But what I'm talking about here is the universal form of prana. And the universal form is totally immaterial. It is of the nature of intelligence and consciousness. And it is this universal prana, which is basically it, controls every aspect of organic function in our physical bodies right down to the cellular level. Now, of course, you know, uh, science has a very different view of this. And again, I would refer you to those articles that I published. Uh, uh, it gives a much more detailed explanation of this. But prana shakti is maintaining the level, uh, maintaining the physical body right down to the level of the individual cells. Uh, next slide, please. The last aspect of shakti is kundalini shakti. Now, prana shakti is, uh, its purpose is to maintain the physical body, uh, to keep it alive and functioning. Kundalini shakti's purpose is a rather creation. And there are two modes of operation uh, which are very distinct from each other. Uh, next slide, please. The first mode of this operation is in gestation, where from the time of conception, where the uh, ovum is fertilized, uh, it begins to divide and grow and split. And eventually we have a human being composed of hundreds of billions of cells of several hundred different types, uh, a living, thinking, breathing human being. Now, most people have asked about this process would say, well, it's the DNA. Well, that's, that's always the answer. It's the DNA. And I started studying some microbiology several years ago. And, and to my surprise, uh, DNA does not do that specifically. What DNA does, and there's something like 20,000 active genes in the human genome, the information in the gene sequences are actually assembly instructions for the various components of cells, uh, pro, uh, components like proteins, enzymes, ribosomes, uh, things like that. But if you were to ask a geneticist, where in the DNA does it say that the human body has two arms, two legs, one nose and tongue? Uh, where in the DNA does it give the sequence of instructions for the creation of an organ such as the eye, which is a multi-stage process. It, it's like this tube shoots out from the spinal cord and a bulb starts to grow on it. It's, it's absolutely amazing. If you say, where are the assembly instructions for the human body? There's no answer. It is not in the DNA, at least as far as they've been able to find. And so it is Kundalini Shakti that is actually in complete control of this process of creation. This is a process so staggering, it's beyond our ability to even remotely conceive of it. So next slide, please. Now, the second area of operation that Kundalini Shakti uh, has is in the spiritual transformative process, which we are all familiar with. And when the baby is born, Kundalini Shakti is said to go into a dormant state in the center at the base of the spine. And then later on in life, uh, maybe as a consequence of uh, various factors such as heredity, spiritual practice, lifestyle, diet, health, and other things, it may become active again later in life. But instead of building a new human being in the fetus of the womb of the mother, as it did uh, initially, it actually attempts to, and I emphasize it, 
it attempts to remodel the brain and nervous system of the individual so it can manifest this much higher faculty of perception. So next slide. So Kundalini and evolution is the last uh, section I'll talk about. And next slide, please. Uh, I'd like to talk a bit about how evolution actually uh, happens. And this is through, of course, genetics. Now, there are two ways in which evolutionary traits can, can happen in genetics. Uh, the first one is through a process of actually the manipulation of the genes and uh, in the chromosomes. And we have 23 pairs of chromosomes in our body, one each from the mother and father. And there is a process in which takes place in when the sex cells are being created, when the sperm and ovum are being created. And this is quite amazing. You might want to investigate this yourself. It's called crossing over. And in this process, uh, the, the chromosomes, the one from the mother and the one from the father are paired up. And then something goes along the gene sequences and it compares the genes between the two chromosomes and where the difference in the sequence is more than a certain percentage, it actually snips out the gene from each of the two chromosomes, swaps them and stitches them back in. It is absolutely mind boggling. And how this process can even happen without some sort of overall controlling agency like Kundalini Shakti, science has no explanation for. But this is one way in which evolution can happen is that genes can be added, uh, they could be changed in whatever way. The second way in which genes can be modified is in a field called uh, epigenetics. And this is one of the most uh, new and up and coming and, and dramatic fields of research. In epigenetics, the genes are not physically changed in the same way that they are with something like the crossing over process. But what happens is the functioning of the genes, whether they're turned off and on and which sequence of them actually operates when they're turned on, uh, this is changed and it's done with various chemical triggers. But again, the process is very poorly understood at present. And from my perspective, I cannot see any way that this can possibly happen because it is so complex without the agency of something like Kundalini Shakti. So this is the way in which evolution proceeds through the modification of uh, the genes. Next slide, please. So if we assume that Kundalini Shakti is involved in uh, the, the process of gestation, it's involved in the process of the creation of the sex cells, then there can be no doubt that it is involved in evolution. And since Kundalini Shakti is, according to those people who have experienced it in its ultimate form, infinitely intelligent, it is not a very big step from there to go to the possibility that evolution has a predetermined goal. And this, I believe personally, is going to be one of the greatest discoveries of the 20th century, uh, up there with relativity theory and other things. Uh, evolution has a predetermined goal. And Kundalini is trying to guide the human race towards that goal, which is enlightenment. Now, our intellect is extremely powerful, more powerful than any other species, at least that we know of, that has evolved on the planet. And for the first time, we have a species that is not only aware of this evolution, but has the ability to either help this evolution or to hinder it. And sad to say, uh, over most of this last 5,000 years, uh, it seems like we have been hindering this process of evolution. Uh, next slide, please. And if we look at our own society, the way it is today, uh, we see consumerism is, is king, gold is the god. Uh, people are encouraged to consume as much as they can, as fast as they can. That is the reason for being. You want to get the, the, latest, the latest television set, the latest phone. And there is very little attention in general paid to the, the spiritual side of life. Um, even though many people you know, have that impulse, uh, in society in general, uh, it is not recognized for its importance. And also we have technology which is uh, to a certain point helpful. I mean, in terms of medical, uh, medical technology, it's saving lives, it's been incredibly wonderful. It has given us a, a knowledge of creation of the universe and black holes and things like that, which is absolutely staggering. But technology at the same time is when it is misused or abused, it actually becomes an impediment to human evolution. And we see this uh, with technology like cell phones where People can't remember numbers anymore. 
because the cell phone does it. They, they, the, these, these instruments are robbing us of our, of our memories. And it is this over-dependence on technology, uh, not technology itself, but the over-dependence on it, which is, the, which is uh, resulting in this blockage in evolution. And Kundalini Shakti, in order to remove these blocks, has brought in wars, uh, revolutions, and terrorism. Because at a very deep psychological level in the race, uh, we instinctively know that there is something wrong with our society, this, this almost total emphasis on materialism at the expense of the uh, spiritual. And uh, as Gopi Krishna pointed out, he said, when this discovery becomes known, that there is a predetermined goal to human evolution and that we are obstructing it, there will be a concerted effort to investigate every aspect of human life, uh, religion, science, politics, education, every aspect of human life will have to be reevaluated in the light of this uh, evolutionary imperative to find out what is the best way to advance this evolution. So uh, next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, I would say that Kundalini is essential or knowledge of Kundalini is absolutely essential for the survival of the race. If we do not discover what is going on with Kundalini, then our prospects for long-term survival are not very good, either through destruction of the environment or direct destruction of ourselves. Um, but Gopi Krishna said at one time, he said, once this, this mechanism is understood, known and understood, and it is facilitated, then the prospects for humanity are glorious beyond us to even remotely imagine uh, the heights to which the human race can, can uh, rise in this case. So, in conclusion, I would just like to encourage each and every one of you uh, to uh, learn as much as you can about Kundalini Shakti, to talk to other people about it, to disseminate the knowledge. And uh, in terms of uh, understanding Kundalini Shakti, I would I would highly recommend uh, Gopi Krishna's books, which are available as eBooks on Amazon, uh, all most of the other uh, online distributors. And uh, you can buy the physical book through the uh, Institute for Consciousness uh, Research website. Also on that website, there is the Learning Center, which gives uh, a summation of many of the ideas I've just uh, proposed today. And for those of you who wish to uh, encourage the research in a more direct way, I would really strongly uh, uh, recommend that you support the Emerging Sciences Foundation, uh, either through the Kundalini Database Project, uh, the online questionnaire, if you, want, if, uh, if you can fill that out uh, and uh, give us more data to uh, do our research with. And also, if you wish to support the ESF financially, there are donor kits, uh, which includes uh, books and CDs of Gopi Krishna. And so whatever way you can to make this information, this knowledge available so that science will eventually come to the realization that Kundalini does exist and that uh, it is absolutely essential for us to understand it uh, in order for us to progress in peace and harmony.